Hello, and welcome to the CCF Online Channel. We are excited for you to be part of another worship experience. We pray that what you learn here today will deepen your relationship with Jesus. Enjoy the message. Good morning once again. So it is indeed a privilege for me after quite some time wasn't able to preach, and I'm really excited to be the messenger of God's Word this morning, and I pray that as I preach the Word of God, may we have a worshipful heart because this is going to be a continuation of our series on Practice Radical Love. But before that, I would like to know if there are first-time visitors here. You, this is your first time to attend CCF Davao. Can you wave at me? i just like to see. Oh, there are some people there. Welcome to CCF Davao. And we hope that this is not going to be your first and last uh, attending this kind of gathering here in CCF Davo. Feel free and relax and may the Word of God also bless you. And for those of us who are faithfully coming here, bless, the Lord, uh, bless you, bless you some more. So, for the sake of the first time guest we have, uh, we are in the series of what we call Practice Radical Love. So, this has been preached after the series of the Gospel of John and now uh, radical love. So a few weeks ago, we were taught about what is this practicing radical love. So when we talk about radical, it simply means going back to the origin. So it's not radical because you turn into something new or to something that is not normally done. Radical means it is normally done faithful to the original. So when you say I want to be radical in my understanding the Word of God, then that means you want to be accurate in handling the Word of Truth, and you want to be accurate in applying it to your life and to the people around you in terms of relationship, in terms of prayer, in terms of giving, evangelism, so on and so forth, and other spiritual disciplines. So that is radical. It is not radical that it is new, but it is simply going back to the origin, to the root. So, our series on practicing radical love is stated in the core values of CCF, which is an acronym of L-O-V-E. Okay. Every organization, whether religious or sectarian or secular, there is what we call a mission, vision, and core value. When we say mission, that is what we do. So, the mission of CCF is to honor God and to make Christ-committed followers who make Christ-committed followers. That is what we do. We make Christ-committed followers who will make Christ-committed followers. The vision is what we see or what we see in the future. And the vision of CCF is we envision a movement of millions of committed followers of the Lord Jesus Christ meeting in small groups, transforming lives, transforming families, communities, and nations with an S for the glory of God. So that is the vision. That is what we want to see in the future. And we keep on striving to have that vision seen. And that is, in order to reach that vision, we have to do what we need to do. And that is the mission, to make disciples in order to have that vision. And in doing that mission, there is what we call the core value, which is actually the behavior on how we do things. How we do things. What, is, what are the parameters or how do we limit ourselves? Like for example, if I am a businessman and if I say I want my product to be a top-notch product and it's going to be a reasonable cost product. So there's the product. But how I do it, if I say, I will have no shortcuts, I want to be God-honoring in everything that I do, when I will relate with my workers, I have to have integrity. The way I do things inside is the same way I do things outside. I have to be honest with my dealings, no shortcuts. Whatever you pay for, that is what I want you to do. So that is a core value, meaning I don't want to give a very nice product out of cheating. So that is the core value. For CCF, our core value is defined by this acronym L-O-V-E or love. And previous weeks, we were taught that love or L stands for 
love God and love others, which exemplifies the greatest commandment of all, which is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your mind, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. And the next great commandment after that is to love your neighbor as yourself. That is why we have love others. That's how we do things. Next is the supremacy of the Scripture. Everything that pertains on how we deal with morals and conduct about sin, holiness, righteousness, and everything that is affected by all of these issues will always be anchored to the Word of God. And not only do we need to understand the Word of God, we have to obey the Word of God. Everything that the Word of God says, we not only understand them, but we have to obey. And then after that is we obey the appointed authorities. Whether we like it or not, there is always a hierarchy of authorities in the home. The father is the leader, the provider, and the lover of his family. In the office, there is always a boss. In the government, there will always be authorities above us. And even in the churches, there will always be spiritual leaders. There will be the elders. There will be the pastors. There will be other servant leaders. So there will always be a hierarchy of authorities. And next one, which was delivered to us initially by Brother Ferdy, which is to volunteer. Meaning, we are not compelled, we are not pressured, we are not forced, we are not coerced. We are volunteering out of our own volition. We do it. And what do we volunteer? We volunteer our treasure, we volunteer our time, and we volunteer our talent. So when we talk about treasure, we talk about money and possessions. Now, we will focus only on this, for this day, volunteer, treasure, and money. And finally, our letter, which is not part of our message this morning, is to engage the family. And later on, it will be discussed in the coming Sundays. So we will focus on V. Now, talking about volunteer, let me tell you a story about this guy. He, is, he was a 23-year-old guy and on April 1st, 1942, he wanted to join the U.S. Army. He is a Christian and a deep Bible-believing Christian. And so when he wanted to join the army, his conviction is he doesn't need to carry a gun, but he wants to join the army. Okay? So after much training with difficulty, so he was now assigned to be a medic. So he was assigned to go to Guam, to Leyte, and to some other parts in the Pacific, Pacific area of war. And the defining moment of this guy was when he was sent to Okinawa, so where so many Allied forces died. During this time, his defining moment was he rescued 75 soldiers single-handedly without firing a single shot. And because of that, months later, he was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor for Courage Under Fire by President Truman of the United States. So he was honored. The Congressional Medal of Honor was given to soldiers whose exemplary performance whose courage under fire can be, cannot be questioned. And they were honored, and he was given that. And his name was Desmond Doss, and he passed away 2006. Okay, so, we believe tayo. So, we, wow, that guy is really something. He, he did something. And not only that, because of his spectacular volunteerism, not firing a single shot. He was further honored by Hollywood. They made a movie to immortalize his achievement because he was considered really a modern-day hero. And the movie was named Haxo Ridge. I, I haven't watched the movie, but I think it's really nice. So I'm not promoting the movie, but what I'm trying to say here is this man did something that needs to be honored. Now, why am I talking about this? So the principle is, 
It is fitting to honor the one who gives himself for the sake of others. So if President Truman saw it fit to honor this guy because he gave himself not to die, but to save 75 soldiers without firing a single shot, then it is fitting to honor this guy. But now let us apply this in the spiritual realm where somebody gave himself not only saved but died in order for us to be saved then that person that being is worthy of the highest honor one can ever imagine and this is you know the most famous verse John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So this God, the Father, gave Jesus Christ, His only Son. He gave, not only gave, you have them, but I'll take Him back. But the kind of giving is demonstrated like this. But God demonstrates His own love. So that is an equivalent to John 3.16. Toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ did not wait for us to be morally upright, to be morally righteous, but while we are still wallowing in our sin, while we were still gossipers, while we were still cheaters, while we were still adulterers, robbers, and all the sin that is common to man, God demonstrates His love by dying for us. And because of that, He needs to be honored. He ought to be honored. If we understand the power of this gospel, if we understand the power of the grace of God, then nothing short of honoring Him can be done but to honor Him, just like President Truman did to Desmond Doss. So how much more we who have experienced the blessing of forgiveness, the blessing of salvation, the blessing of eternal life, the blessing of reconciliation, the blessing of adoption to become children of God, then we can honor Him. It is in order to honor Him. Now our main text this morning is we want to honor God. We want to honor God. So many things will come to our mind. How do we honor God? So let's focus on this verse. We can honor God in so many ways. Honor the Lord from your wealth, from the first fruit of all your produce. But what do we mean first by honor or in the Hebrew word kabed? What is it? The Hebrew word honor means to be heavy or weighty or to glorify. You know, there's a Tagalog idiom when we say when somebody comes and then he is a man of accomplishment, his name and his reputation precedes him always. So when he comes in, and then we'll just take notice of him so that our eyes will always be glued upon him, and we'll just say, ang bigat ng dating. Do you, do you remember those words? Ang bigat. Because there is glory in that man. For example, the president of the Philippines will come here. You won't just sit around there even if he makes himself... Uh, just not to, not to be taken notice of. If you say, oh, there is the president at the back, so maybe you will just turn around and forget who's, what, who's the one talking here, and you just turn your head, oh, the president is there, the president is there, because of the glory that he brings. So that is glory, and that is honor, meaning the weight. In English, it tells us to regard with great respect, revere, venerate, exalt, pay homage to. You know, in ancient times, when there is a conquering country over smaller, weaker country, the conquering country will have a time when the weaker countries that were conquered will pay their tribute in chests of treasures, gold, feathers, like that, or whatever is precious to their country, and then they will set it at the feet of their kings or emperors. That is honoring, so giving something. In this sense, when we honor God, to honor God with our words is one thing, but to honor God with something that we give is another thing. Now, this is our topic this morning. 
Our message this morning is give to honor God. If I will transfer this word to, okay, give honor to God, the meaning will be different. But if you say give to honor God, okay, that means you give in honor to God. Uh, you give in order to honor God. But if you say give honor to God, so you're just saying you're giving honor to God. But our title is give to honor God. Now, I have to be very careful delivering this message because this might be your first time, especially for the first time guests and visitors. We are not preaching this Sunday after Sunday after Sunday to pound the congregation, give, 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 so that we will not be accused that we are talking about coercing or talking about prosperity gospel. But because of God's providence in this series, we are now talking about giving as a way of honoring God. Okay, having said that, there are other people or other even church leaders who squirm at the idea of teaching about giving and then they miss the point and even the people of God will miss the point or the amazing blessing that they should have experienced that is attached to giving. Because in giving, there is always that connection of blessing of God. And that is why I will not apologize because even if this message is difficult, as the Lord spoke to us, it is His sovereign decree that we will hear this message this morning. So that when we come out of this place, our understanding and our honoring of God will no longer be the same. It will no longer be a lip service, but it will be something that will be encouraging, something that is very edifying when we give and we want to honor God. We will see things happening in our lives and the people around us and even the ministry of God. So that is our message this morning. Give to honor God. Now, why is it so important? There are so many topics in the Bible that are mentioned and we will see. How many times they are mentioned in the Bible? Prayer. Is prayer important? Yes. How many times is it mentioned? 371 times. Believe and believing. Is it important? Yes. It is mentioned 270 times because it's important. Love and loving. How, how many times? It's 714 times. So these topics in the Bible are so important. What about giving? Is it important? It's mentioned 2,612 times in the entire Bible. What about money and possession? Because they are so interrelated. How many times did the Bible talk about it? 2,350 times. Now, if you, if you collect giving and money possessions, because these are very, very related, it's, it's more than 5,000 times. So that means to say, won't you wonder why is it so important? Why the Almighty God put this here? Why is money so important? Let me ask you. So guess, whisper to your neighbor. What's the reason? Why it's important? Why is it really important? Any answer, you just guess. Can I tell you why? Okay. Why is money, possessions, and giving so emphasized in the Bible more than heaven, hell, prayer, faith, more than any topic? Why? The reason is our handling of money is a litmus test of our true character. It is an index of our spiritual life, our stewardship, of our money and our possessions becomes the story of our life. So money is really a litmus test. How we use our money will tell us directly what is our level of spiritual maturity. Because our life is really a story on how we dispense our possessions, our money, and how we give it to them. So. If we give stingily, in Tagalog, kuripot, then that will be the story of our life. If we are generous givers, whether to our friends, 
to the work of God and to others, then that will be the story of our life because that is the reason why money is important. And then the Lord Jesus Christ did not leave it to the best financial advisors, financial gurus to talk about money, 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 and he talked about it more often than the other topics in the Bible because it is really a very important index to measure the character of a person. When it comes to a man's real nature, money, if money is, sorry for that, money is of first importance, money is an exact index to a man's true character. All through scripture, there is an intimate correlation between the development of a man's character and how he handles money. So how we handle money, how are we attached to it, or how we are loose at it defines our character. And that is why Jesus Christ never leave us groping in the dark what to do. He gave us instructions. How do I relate myself with money? Money is not evil. Money is neutral. It is neither good nor evil. But Jesus Christ simply said, the love of money is the root of all evil. Money is not the root of all evil, but the love of it. And that is why Jesus Christ was saying, here are my instructions how you should relate to these things. And how we should relate to these things will really define what is really inside our hearts. Jesus Christ mentioned this, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I used to think like this, For where my heart is, there will your treasure be also. But the Word of God says, For where your treasure, your money is, your heart will follow. If your money is placed in a stock market or placed in a business investment, you will always dream about it. You will always look at the newspaper, whether the stock goes up or it goes down, or you will see whether that business investment that you are entering is profitable or not. That means the heart follows where the treasure is. So, Jesus Christ was on the dot. He knows perfectly what's inside our hearts. Whatever, wherever we put our money, then it, our hearts will follow. If we put our money on some kingdom work for the church, for missions, for the support of uh, the poor, for the support, the stewardship of, of maintenance and uh, work of the church, the support of the church, then we will always Look at it, okay, uh, how can I help it there? So if, if you think that the money is not enough, then probably you will wonder, Lord, I need to pray. Uh, maybe the, the, the need is really very high. So it simply means that wherever we put our money, our heart will just follow. Now let me give you two examples, great men in the Bible. You know the story of Zacchaeus? So Jesus Christ was going in Jerusalem and then, or in Galilee and then, a tax collector by the name of Zacchaeus, a short man, so he climbed up the sycamore tree so that he, he, can be, he can see Jesus Christ and invite him to his house for dinner. And when Jesus Christ came, and then, oh, Zacchaeus, get down there, and then I will have dinner in your place. So as they were eating dinner in their place, Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my possessions I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will give back four times as much. So you will see here a man who is rich, a tax collector, was willing to part ways with money, even half of his possession. And Jesus Christ, being omniscient, saw that the saving power, the grace of God, has entered the hearts of Zacchaeus. And then Jesus Christ said, to him, today salvation has come to this house. So we're not saying that if we give half of our possession to the poor, we are saved. It simply means the reality of salvation, the reality of the saving power of the Lord Jesus Christ has come to the heart of the person. That is why he was able to give half of his possession. Is that okay with you? Okay, so that's the first example. 
And another example, in Luke chapter 18, this is, this is the story of a rich young ruler who one day come to the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Then Jesus Christ said, why do you call me good? Only God is good. And then he, he moved on to say, okay, if you want to be perfect, do not commit adultery, do not commit murder, honor your father and your mother, and then uh, do it. Do not be covetous. And then the rich young ruler said, I have done this thing since my youth. Nagawa ko na yan lahat. And Jesus Christ said, one thing you lack. When he heard this, he said to him, one thing you still lack. Sell all that you possess and distribute it to the poor and you shall have treasure in heaven and come follow me. And what's the response? The litmus test? What did the rich young ruler said? But when he had heard these things, he became very sad for he was extremely rich. So you will see now the difference. Both are rich, but both have a different response to wealth. And that is why money, to talk about money in the context of the church, is not taboo and it should never be avoided, but it has to be understood according to what the Bible teaches us. Now, what about this? And remember the words of the Lord Jesus Christ that He Himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. So this is a verse that's saying that in our giving, there is always that blessing because there is no reason why the Lord Jesus Christ would say, blessed are you when you give than when you receive. So the blessing is always anchored to the giving. This is really very clear. You know, there are over 7,000 promises in the Bible, and every promise have a premise or a condition. The greatest number of promises has to do with giving, and the promises of God, when it comes to blessing, has to do with generosity. It has to do with giving. So in the Bible, because we know that we are being taught that God is always ready to bless His children. There is always a premise how He blesses us. When He promises us, when He promised to bless us, He's saying, if you do this, then the Lord will bless you. And there are 7,000 promises which are always related to giving. In every place, you may wonder, regardless whether it is a religious organization or like a fellowship, there will always be what we call givers and takers. So when we say givers, they always give. When you say takers, they always take. So check yourself whether in your whole stay in wherever you are, such as gatherings like this, are you a taker or are you a giver? So when you say you're a taker, you have never once contributed or gave to the Lord's work. So I pray that you will not be takers, but you will be givers. Jesus Christ said, give. So here is now the condition. Give, and then the promise. It will be given to you. They will pour out into your lap a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. So when the Lord gives, it's not in Bisaya, Tihik, or Kuripot in Tagalog, or Stingy in English. So when He gives blessing to us, though we don't deserve them, it is good measure. It's sometimes when we buy uh, vitamin supplements, so the vitamin supplements, when we open it, it's almost two-thirds with uh, the tablets, but the remaining one-third is cotton and air. So that is not Good measure. It's not even pressed down. When you say pressed down, it is densely compacted, shaken together. There will be no air or voids. And not only full to the brim, but you hardly can close the cover or the lid because it is running over. So that's the blessing of God. And there is always a condition. The condition is you give and it will be given to you. Now, we are not talking here of an investment mentality so that when you give, oh, it's always running over. If I will give 100, by the rule of 
a hundredfold, so I will give 1,000. I will get 1,000. If I will give 1,000, maybe 100,000 will come back. No, no, no. You are simply giving because you worship God, you love the Lord, and you want to honor Him by your giving. So we want to establish that first before we can have the blessing of the Lord. Now look at this. God is not a killjoy. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, the Lord Jesus Christ. How will he not also with him freely give us some things? Did, they re did it read it right? Give us what? All things. Say it with me. All things. So when he says all things, that means temporal and eternal things. It may be part material, part spiritual, and all all the heavenly blessings it will be given to us on the premise that he has given first his son jesus christ and we have this relationship with him then all things will be given to us we may say oh i don't need that but that thing that you hate most will be given to you even suffering even difficulties in life because blessing will not be defined only by prosperity because god is more concerned of the development of our character and that is why he will give us all things for our own good because in the final analysis only no only god knows what is best for you yes or no yes god knows what is best for you and me and that is why our message this morning is give to honor God. So the question now is, okay, I know that I have to honor God and I have to give. So we may have so many ideas, okay, I am giving. So I will now check whether my giving is right. So let us now learn theology. How do I give to honor God? So we we now change the title a little. How do I give to honor God? So let the Bible speak because the Bible says it is profitable for teaching, for rebuke, for correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God, the believers, women, children, men of all ages and of all time will be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And that is why we have to go back to the Bible. And Proverbs says, our main text, it says, Honor the Lord from your wealth and from the first of all your produce. So all your produce, whether what ability the Lord has given you, because the Lord says in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18, God has given us the ability to make wealth. So we honor Him from our wealth and from all our produce. So whatever that might be, we cannot enumerate them, but you know them that you are able to produce and to make wealth. So we honor Him from our wealth and from the first of our produce. So we have here the principle of the first. So when we have something, we always give the Lord first. He doesn't need to have the leftovers. When we give to the Lord, it will always be the first. What will happen? When we do that, so here is again the promise, the condition, and then the promise. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. Okay, Your vats will be, will be plenty. Your field will overflow. Okay, The nature of the first fruits, we have to understand what is this. So in, in the book written by Randy Alcorn, uh, entitled Money, Possessions, and Eternity. He's a Christian author. He said, The nature of the first fruits requires that it be taken off the top. It's both the best and the first. So whatever we have, when we receive a bonus, when we receive our income, we don't have to hoard it. Sabi niya? We immediately give it to the Lord. It is not to be hidden. It's not to be hoarded or distributed in any other way it will always be chopped off, given to the Lord. If it is the first, that's the principle of the first, because we understand that everything that we have, even ourselves, are owned by God. And we only give Him back the first. Now, how do we give? Because the question now is, I want to honor God, so I want to give. So there are some guidelines and instructions on how we give according to the Scriptures. 
We give individually, whether you are receiving from your parents, if you're a student, you're a daughter, a son, and then you receive an allowance from school. Parents, it is your responsibility to teach your children how to honor God with their wealth and giving proportionately. As I will be talking about tithing a, while, a little later, we have to teach them that the first part will be given to the Lord. If you are also earning something, whether you are salaried, you're a businessman, you have to give individually. Each one must do just as he proposed in his heart. So each one. But of course, if you're married, that means you're already one. Two will become one flesh. So that's what we're talking about here. So giving individually. And then another way of giving that we're instructed to do is we don't give grudgingly, but we give generously. Now here is a very common uh, verse that is used by many prosperity gospel teachers, the prosperity health and wealth teachers. And that is why so many Christian groups are aghast or they are squirming or they don't feel comfortable when Malachi chapter 3 verse 8 to 11 is being preached because it's again used as a way to make the people guilty. But on the other side of the coin, because it is really the Word of God, when we understand it properly in its context, it will become a blessing to His people. And that is why we have to preach Malachi chapter 3 in its proper context. So, to understand generosity, we have to understand the distinction between tithing and offering. Tithing is one thing, Offering is another thing. So when we give our tithes, when we give our offering, they go together. And if we only give our tithes and then we don't give our offering, that's still okay because you are not supposed to be burdened. If you give your tithes, that's okay. But if you grow in the Lord because you just want to be obedient with your tithes, but as you grow in the Lord, as your love for Him grows, as you worship Him more and more, not only with your mind, not only with your heart, but also with your pocket, when your pocket is already born again, then on top of that tithing, you will have the offering. And that is how you define generosity. You can donate 2%, donate 4%, 6%, 7%, but you cannot tithe 2% because tithe means 10% or a tenth of everything. So, the problem here is, sabi ni Malakai to the Israelites, you are cursed with a curse for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. That's the problem. Now, they will see, okay, what's the problem here? There is a curse because they are robbing God. So the only way for the curse to be lifted up is they have to do what God requires of them. And to instruct us, to really make us theologically right and sound, where did we get the word tithe? Okay? And how do we understand the tithe? Leviticus 27.30, it says here, Thus all the tithe of the land, of the seed of the land, or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. When you say holy, it is separated. It is set apart to the Lord. That means you don't own it. We don't own that tithe, the tent that we have. So when we have something, we say, oh, I have been good today. I have, I have constructed my, my new building, my new uh, laboratory, for example. And then we say, oh, that is ours. No, that is the Lord's. And then 10% of that really is owned by God because it is holy to Him that is set apart. So that is the tithe. Now, even in that time, to tell us that giving and tithing is different, sometimes we have this wrong understanding that in the Old Testament there are under tithes because they are under the law. They are not into voluntary offering. But it is wrong because in the time of Moses, look at here, and the skillful men who were performing all the work of the sanctuary came, each from the work he was performing, and they said to Moses, the people are bringing much more than enough for the construction work which the Lord commanded us to, to perform. 
So they are building the tabernacle and then the people keep on giving on top of normal week-to-week -week giving, which is tithing. So there is now a need for the construction of the temple and then they're bringing much more than enough. So Moses issued a command and a proclamation was circulated throughout the camp saying, let no man or woman any longer perform work for the contributions of the sanctuary. Thus, the people were restrained from giving anymore. So, si Moses na nagsabi, Tama na! Tama na! Sobra na! Hindi na namin maubos! Tama na to, We can already build this! But the people got caught into the excitement and the thrill of giving because they know they are giving to the Lord. When we give to the Lord, our hearts will be different. But if we give to someone, somehow there's a string attached. Like for example, if you think you're not giving to the Lord, you're just giving to CCF per se. And then when you go to the CR and you see that the toilet has no tissue or there's no running water or it smells something, then you will say, I have given my tithes here. Why is it so dirty? Why is it so smelly? You're not giving to the Lord. But when you give to the Lord, you won't feel that. When it springs out of your hand, you have no control of it because you gave it to God. You get that? Amen. And that is why these people in the Old Testament fell into that excitement that they were told, no, stop giving anymore. Stop giving. But normally, for the support of the church, for the support of the, the Levites, because in the Old Testament, there are three tithes amounting to 23% a year. They have the tithes for the support of the priests and the Levites. They have the tithes for the sacred festival. And then they have a tithe every three years, which is for for the support of the poor, the widow, and the orphans. So since Israel at time is both a spiritual and a civil uh, government, so it's also a form of their taxation, but their 10% is basically for the support of religious purposes. Now, if that's the case, we know that because during that time, when people no longer tithe and offered, they are cursed with a curse. So what is this curse? Because they're no longer giving their full tithes and offering. Because we might be led to think that, ah, I already have given my 2% tithe or my 3% offering, then I have been generous at that Sunday. No, there is a curse. And we will not be surprised if there are some of you here, and it pains to for me to tell you this, maybe you are in a financial situation that no matter how hard you earn, it's like putting a money with a pocket, with holes in the pocket, like what Hosea said, or Haggai said. You have sown much, but harvest little. You eat, but there is not enough to be satisfied. So you eat, gutom pa rin. You drink, but there is not enough to become drunk. So you try to get drunk, but no matter how you drink, you cannot be drunk. Okay? But there is enough. You put on clothing, but there, but no one is warm enough. And he who earns, earns wages to put into purses with holes. So when you receive your check or the income or the salary, it will not reach the, the end of the month. So it's like a cycle and then there's a possibility that you will now borrow, you will now enter into a debt or a vicious cycle just to pay off the debts. But these actually are financial curse and we will not be surprised so what shall we do what is the solution because there is a premise a condition and when we adhere to that condition and premise there is always a promise and what's the solution bring the half tithe the whole tithe into the storehouse we bring it into the storehouse during the time it was the temple of jerusalem so for us here, if you believe that you have been blessed, you are now considering CCF as your home church, then you bring your tithes to the home church. If this is your first time and you enjoy our message and you ask me, I will, I'd like to give this. No, you support your, your church. You give it to your church where you think you are part of and you are a member of. But for those who are here, you support the church because this is the command of God to bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. So we're not yet talking about offering. We're talking about tithing. So we have to distinguish 
tithing and offering. So the purpose of that is so that there may be food in my house. So however the church functions with the leadership, when we give our tithes, we don't control how it is spent, but it will be controlled by the leadership. When I give my tithes, when our family will give our tithes and our offerings, that's it. I don't know how, how it's done, but we know that it's being used for the furtherance of the kingdom of God. And look at this. The Lord said, test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. Didn't we learn that we, have, we don't have to test the Lord? You should not tempt the Lord your God. I agree, that's true. But in the entire Bible, this is only the only verse that tells us to test the Lord. And in giving. Sabi niya, in Tagalog, subukan niyo ako. Try me in this. Testing ko. Bisaya. Okay? Subukan niyo ako. Okay? Former President Estrada, when he was inducted during his inauguration, he said, in Tagalog, I'll translate this in English a while ago, he said, Dito sa aking pamahalaan, walang kaibigan, walang kamakamag-anak, wag niyo akong subukan. It means, do not try me, do not corrupt me. But here, it's the opposite. God said, if you want to know that I exist, you want to see how faithful I am to you in every need that you have, I'm not talking about prosperity gospel. I am talking about what Malachi is saying. Test me in this. Subukan mo ako. Have you tested God already in this? Try Him. And you will see wonders, the amazing things that God will do to you. It is not really the amount, but it's really how you bring the whole tithe. If you're receiving 50 pesos a week, then cut off 5 pesos. If you're receiving 500, then cut off 50 pesos. That's faithfulness and obedience to the Lord. And then what He promised is, He will open the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. How do you picture overflowing? Is it limited or in cell phone lingo, unli? Unlimited. That is our God. Our God is a very generous God who even gave Himself. He gave His Son for us. How much more all of these things? So you will question, oh, you are so Old Testament. It's only Mosaic law. No. 500 years before Moses wrote this tithing in Leviticus, it's already happening during the time of Abraham when he tithed to Melchizedek, the priest or the prophet of Salem. He said, And blessed be the God Most High who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And then he gave him, referring to Melchizedek, a tenth of all. So all the spoils of the war, Abraham Tithed to Melchizedek. That is 500 years before the Mosaic Law. And also Jacob, when he was now returning to his homeland because of the fear of meeting Esau, so he said to the Lord, And I return to my father's house in safety, then the Lord will be my God. And of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth or a tithe to you. So that precedes the Mosaic Law. So it's already there in history. Now, you say, okay, that's Old Testament. What about the New Testament? Jesus Christ abolished that. No, you are wrong if you say that Jesus Christ abolished it. It is not abolished. He said to the Pharisees, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe, mint, and dill, and come in, and have neglected the weightier provisions of the law, such as justice and mercy and faithfulness, but these are the things you should have done without neglecting the others. So he was saying the things such as justice, mercy, and faithfulness you should do without neglecting tithing. In the NLT, New Living Translation, it is very clear in the paraphrased version. It says here with the same verse, What sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and Pharisees? Hypocrites! For you are careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens, 
but you ignore the more important aspects of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. You should tithe. Yes, but do not neglect the more important things. So Jesus Christ did not abolish. So what's the context here? In, in uh, Matthew chapter 15, the Jews were re being rebuked by Jesus Christ because He was saying, the Jews were saying to the people, instead of supporting their parents, if you give your tithe to the temple, that's already enough, instead of supporting your parents. So Jesus Christ was saying, no, support your parents, support them, especially in their twilight years. But at the same time, because these are the weightier matters of the law, you also give your tithe. Because in so doing, the Jews were said to be hypocrites because the tithe was exclusively given to the temple without supporting the, the, the parents. They call it korban. And that is why Jesus Christ rebuked them. But he did not abolish tithing. He actually reinforces it. When you tithe, do not forget the weightier matters of the law. So how does it apply to us today? So when we have a support, when we need to support the tithing in the church, and there is a need like your family, do not forget to support your families. Do not to support righteous causes on top of what, what you are already giving as a tithe. It's not like, okay, I will give this Sunday and I only have 1,000 pesos. So because I want to support this church, so I will divide my 1,500, which is 50% of my tithe will go here and 50% will go here. No, that is rubbing God. You give the 1,000, the whole of 1,000, which is your tithe to the Lord, and then if God will prod you in your heart, not by compelling you, but as you are led, led by the Lord, then you give. Regardless if it is 100 pesos, 5 pesos, 10 pesos. That's just being practical and being accurate in understanding and applying the Word of God. Is that okay with you so far? Amen. Okay. So let's continue. The tithe is God's historical method to get people on the path of giving. In that sense, it can serve as a gateway to the joy of true grace giving. So it is the gateway to true giving. That is the starting point. Randy Alcorn said, tithing is not the finish line of giving, but the starting block. So, we will not be tempted to say, there are people here who are tithing. There are people here who are givers because they tithe. No. That is the starting block for every Christian. And as we grow in our understanding, we grow further. We go beyond our tithe because it is not the finish line. It's not the beginning. It is the training wheels of giving. It is not the ceiling, but the floor. It's like learning to ride a bike. So before you learn to ride a bike, there is a training wheel. So until you know how to bike, you remove the training wheel. So do not remain in the training wheel that you're still in the bike. Even if you are 20 years biking already, you still have the training wheel. You have to remove the training wheel because you can bike wherever you want regardless of the roughness of the road, regardless of the territory. So same with giving. Tithing is the starting point. The purpose of the tithe is to support God's work, but the primary purpose of the tithe is to put God first in our lives. So that is the purpose. While we understand that we are supporting, but deliberately in my mind, in my mind, I will always be conscious. I will always be aware that everything that I receive is always part of that. First, I will put God first in everything. That is the essence of our tithing. Now, another way is you give regularly. Unless people give systematically, they rarely give substantially. For example, so many are giving sporad sporadas. Sporadoc, uh, what you call that? Intermittently. Sporadic. Yun, sporadic. Meaning, I give this month, next month, next month I miss, and then I'll give another month, and then next two months, and three months I miss, and then another one. Or, if you're on vacation, and then you, you are on vacation on another place, and it is a Sunday, so it's like you have a bonus that you cannot give a tithe there. No, it has to be deliberate. Because if you want to support the, the work of God, and God is first, then it's like, paying a rent in a house or a mortgage or 
an amortization of a car. You don't say that I will pay this month and the next month I don't pay. No, because that belongs to God. We're not paying God. It's simply honoring God because that is giving regularly. Another one, giving is voluntary. You must each decide in your heart how much to give and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. So you see, CCF does not pass the offering plate because we don't want you to be pressured. It should be voluntary. Like for example, if the offering plate is there and then you don't want to be pressured, so there is a... There is already a momentum that you are now in your pocket. And then when the offering plate is, is in front of you, but it already passed, oh, the offering plate passes me, so I was not able to give. So don't be like that. That's ridiculous. Okay, and then if you see that someone has given already, so, and he's your friend, so you say that this is my pamalengke, this is for my grocery, this is for marketing, but my friend gave, so I also give. So you were forced. So give voluntarily and deliberately, meaning... You have to see that God is always first. Another one, give cheerfully. Each one must do just as he has purpose in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So when we give cheerfully, God loves it so much. They will say, if I am not cheerful in giving, because when my money gets out of my pocket, oh, the money is going out, huh? I cannot be cheerful, so that's why I will not give. So that when I am, when I abstain, when I abstain in giving, then I will be cheerful. No, abstaining from giving does not make you cheerful. So when you give, and when you feel something, it is now an issue of obedience. God loves a cheerful giver, but at the same time, God loves also an obedient giver. So regardless of how you feel, if you really love God, cheerfulness will just follow. In Matthew 6, 21, it says, For where your treasure is, your heart will also be. So for where you put your treasure, then your heart will also be there. So give proportionately. So when you say give proportionately, it's like 100%, how much of it will go to God and how much of it will be left to you. Look at the story of this widow. And he sat down opposite the treasury, referring to the Lord Jesus Christ, and began observing how the people were putting money into the treasury. And many rich people were putting, up, putting large sums. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which amount to a cent. Now what the Lord Jesus Christ said, calling his disciples to him, sabi niya, halika, gather around. Truly I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all the contributors to the treasury, for they all put in out of their surplus, but she out of their poverty put in all she owned, all she had to live on. So when you say proportionately, God is not only concerned of how much you give. He is also concerned of how much you keep. So if you are giving out of your surplus, we know it's surplus, then there is much left. So we are not saying that all of you liquidate everything and give everything to God. It's between you and God. But what we are learning here is we give proportionately. And tithing is a proportion or that is 10% of what we have earned. So in God's sight, according to A.W. Tozer, my giving is measured not by how much I have given, but by how much I could have given and how much I had left after I made my gift. So God looks at both sides, what we have given and what remains in the pocket. Another one, when you give, give quietly. Matthew 6, 3 to 4 says, But when you give to the poor, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving will be in secret, for your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So when you give, do not ring the bell. Do not ring bells. You will tell, the, you'll tell your friends, ah, sandali lang, huh? just for a while because I will drop my offering to the tight box. Or, halika, come with me because I will drop my offering in the tight box. Do not do that. But how do we square with this? Because the Lord Jesus Christ also said, 
Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Meaning, we have to show also the good works. So there is on one side, do it in secret, and also on the other side, show to the world that you are giving because people will know that you are a different kind of breed because of your love for others. And you can, you can express that love by giving. They say you can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. That's a common cliche or that's a common phrase. So how do we do that? What we are being taught by the counsel of the Word of God is when we give our offerings, we don't want to draw attention to us. Just give, whether they will see you or not. Because later on, people will really know that you help this brother, you help this sister. When this is sick, so you give on top of your tithes, you support that, you support this. Nothing wrong with that. But if you give to impress people, that is very inappropriate. And God will be displeased with that. On the extreme, don't be like James Bond giver. Like you wait until everybody is gone and because you really want to give anonymously, then you will say, oh, wala nang tao sa church. Then you will bring out and then tago. Okay, wala. Okay. That's ridiculous. So you give something quietly and normally without announcing to the world that you are giving. There are usual practices that if you donate a wall or you donate a pew, donated by Mr. and Mrs. like that. So you already have your reward. This wall was built under the leadership of like that. So we don't do that as believers because we want the praise and the glory to go to God. One of the great tests for Christian leaders is whether we can trust God to provide financially without courting or favoring big donors. That is why it is good for leaders, especially for pastors, not to know who the big givers are because there is really that strong temptation, although we pray that they will not be tempted to favor or to court big donors. And that is a big test. That's why the, the beauty of giving normally without really announcing is really very good. And on the other hand, for the givers, perhaps the greatest test for givers is whether we are able to give of ourselves and our resources without getting the credit, without impressing others. Concern only that God gets the glory. So when we give, it's only for the glory of God. Whether people will know it or not, it doesn't matter. For as long as the glory goes to God, the glory goes to God. And I am not against rich people because Paul says, instruct those who are rich in this world. Abraham was rich. Jacob, Isaac, Solomon, David, they are mightily used by God. Sabi dito, in this present world, not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. God is not a killjoy. He wants us to enjoy His blessings. He is not against stingy. He wants you and me to enjoy all the blessings that is in store for us. Instruct them to do good. To be rich in good works. Giving is part of that. And then be generous and ready to share. So this is on top of our, over and above our tithing. Why? Because we are storing up the treasure of a good foundation for the future in heaven. So that they may take hold of what is life indeed. We never realize that what we are doing with our money has an eternal effect. We never realize, many of us do not realize that we are really very, very rich someday. And how we become someday has something to do with what we are doing with the riches that we have now. And this is a sobering fact. Always remember, I don't care how big our bank accounts are, how many bank accounts do we have, or how many millions do we have? Because Paul says, we have brought nothing into the world, so we cannot take anything out of it either. If we don't have the Lord Jesus Christ, we are the poorest people in the world, even if we have everything. But even if you don't have everything, 
only a little or comfortably little, but if you have the Lord Jesus Christ, you are the richest person in this world. And only people who have that same experience will rejoice with you saying that you are rich. Now tell your neighbor, if you think that he is a believer, you are rich. Okay, so believe in that because that is in store for his children. Give to honor God. Okay, that's our title. Now, for businessmen, you know this man who this is? Okay, this is William Tyndale. In 1536, he was burned at stake because he tried to translate the Latin Bible into English. But there's a story behind the story. There was a man, a businessman by the name of Sir Humphrey Monmouth. He financed the translation of Tyndale against all odds because at that time, no one is allowed to read the Bible, no one is allowed to translate the Bible, and no one is allowed to interpret the Bible himself. But Tyndale risked his own life together with Sir Humphrey Monmouth. He's a businessman. And then he financed the translation of the first printed Bible in England. In 1536, the church leadership during that time, I don't need to mention the name of the church, but you know that in your church history, he was burned at stake. But when he was burned at stake, his prayer was, Lord, I pray that the, king's, the king of England's eye will be opened. And three years later, in 1539, King Henry VIII published the Bible, the great English Bible, with the, with the war between Spain and England during the time. King Henry VIII was forced to spite the Pope in, in, in Spain, or the King of Spain, and its, its uh, position there. He printed the Bible in English because of the work of Tyndale, but Tyndale was already dead at that time. That was 1539. God answered the prayer of Tyndale. And you have to give it to this man and Sir Humphrey Monmouth. Later on, in 1611, the King James Version, which is now commonly printed today, it is sad that we neglect the Bible that we have, but during that time, it's so precious. We have the 1611 King James Version, which was a... Uh, which, which used the Tyndale version as a source as it translated the English Bible and some of the older versions from Greek and Hebrew. But Tyndale did something to influence the King James Version. So we are happy because of that person. So if God has blessed you and you think there is a value in giving to God, then you will say, that I really worship God when you are also in ties or when you are really compelled as you worship God in even your giving. So how do you give? Maybe it's very difficult today. You have to understand that in order to be generous, brethren, we wish to make known to you that the grace of God which has been given in the churches of Macedonia, you have to experience first the grace of God. You have to understand and really give your life to the Lord before you can give generously. Even in the great ordeal of affliction, even in deep poverty, even if hirap na hirap ka, there will always be generosity. So what can we say with this? According to Pastor Peter Tanchi, he says, generosity is not the monopoly of rich people. Generosity is not driven by income level. Generosity is driven by your love for the Lord, whether you are rich or poor. So if you say, tithing and giving is only for the rich, I pray that one day when I will have a financial windfall, if I have a breakthrough in my finances, if I am out of my debt already, then I will give. Don't kid yourself. If you are not generous today, you will never be generous. You have to experience the grace of God. Even if they are poor, Paul says, For I testify that according to their ability and beyond their ability, they gave of their own accord. So these Macedonian believers not only gave within their ability, but beyond their ability. True believers have understood as they grow, as we grow in our understanding and love for God, we will now be graduating from 10% 
then later on, our giving will be, why not try 12%? Why not try 15% and grow bigger and bigger and bigger as we grow? Even me, I am also learning in these things. As I face the Word of God, the rebuke in my heart was boom, 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 left and right, up and down, up and down, wherever. But that is the Word of God. It convicts us, but it transforms us. And when the Word of God convicts us and transforms us and we submit and obey the Word of God, then God will definitely bless us. Amen? Amen. And even, Paul says, begging us with much urging. So they say, please, please, even if they are poor, allow us to help. Allow us, please allow us to help. Even with what we have, even the little that we have. Please allow us to help. We will also experience that. Our hearts will be thrilled when we are able to help. We are not only told or encouraged to help, but we will initiate. We will tell people, allow me to help you. Allow me to do these things for you. Because that is the growth. When our hearts or our minds understood the gospel, our hearts are transformed, our wallets will be born again as well. Our bank accounts will be born again. There will be no more hidden accounts. We believe that it all belongs to God and it is, and it is at His own disposal. So Paul was even surprised. Sabi niya, not as we had expected. So they gave overflowingly because they, gave, they first gave themselves to the Lord. That's the reason why people become so generous. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your own sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. If we understand this, the God of the heavens, the infinite one, the omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient one, came to become poor, so that we'll become rich, then nothing will come out from our hearts but gratitude, gratitude, never-ending gratitude. Karl Barth says, Grace and gratitude belong together. When we experience grace, gratitude is tied up like heaven and earth. Grace evokes gratitude like the voice and echo. Gratitude follows grace as thunder follows lightning. So it can never be separated. If you are stingy, don't force yourself. Cry out to the Lord, kneel before God, and Lord, let me experience your saving power so that I may have this heart that is grateful to you. Finally, when all is said and done, the currency of this world will be worthless at our death or Christ's return, both of which are imminent. You imagine, if today is your last day and a few moments from now, you will face the Maker all of your wealth, all of your currency will have no meaning. Or, if a moment from now, the Lord Jesus Christ will return with a shout of an archangel, with a loud blast of the trumpet, and the dead in, and the dead in Christ will rise first, and those who are still alive in the coming of the Lord, we will be caught up together with the Lord in the clouds, and we will be forever with Him. When that day will come, all our currencies here, all our money, all our possessions will have no meaning at all. Because when Christ returns, everything that we have here will be radically transformed. And what we have here will become nothing. And that is why, as of today, learn to have a loose hold of these things. Learn to honor God. And how do we honor God? Give to honor God. If that has blessed you today, if you think that you are still struggling, if you think that this is making you uncomfortable, that's okay. All of us at one time or another struggle this part. But when we have an obedient heart, when we have a heart that really wants to obey, Lord, increase my faith. Increase my faith to obey you. Then God will answer your prayer and then He will give you a heart that is full of gratitude, a heart that is overflowing with liberality and generosity. Then you will be able to give to honor God. Amen to that? Amen. Let's all please rise. Heavenly Father, we... Praise you. We give you thanks, Lord. 
Your word is powerful, living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It pierces between the soul and the spirit and it divides and it enters the bone and marrow and nothing is hidden before you. And all of us will give an account when the day will come when we will face you. When all is said and done, when the history will fall down, we pray, dear God, that when we are face to face with you, we will hear those precious words. Thou good and faithful servant, you have been faithful in the things, the earth and temporal things that I have given you. You will be faithful in the bigger things that I will give you. Enter into the joy of your master. Father, I pray that you will impassion, inflame our hearts to love you more, to know you more, O Lord. Show yourself. Make your face shine upon your people, O God, so that we can love you more. We can only give because you gave yourself first to us. And Father, as we part ways from each other's presence, we pray, dear God, that you will bless your people. Bless everyone, Lord, wherever they go. Bless the work of their hands. And Father, may these words that we have heard will always be cherished and treasured in our heart. For all of this we pray in the sweet and glorious name of your Son, Jesus Christ. And everybody say, Amen.